Pallavi, yes, the stage please. is all yours. Oh, thank you. Very kind of you, sir. Uh, hello and uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome all the audience, all the speakers, uh, and all our faculty and everyone who is joining in due course of time uh, to this uh, CME program. Uh, we have expert speakers uh, specifically uh, for academic um, uh, knowledge of all the trainees who are interested in uh, specifically all the colleagues who are interested in research work. So without taking more time, I would request Dr. Suyo uh, to invite our chairperson, um, that is Dr. Nishikan Thorat, uh, to take the chairperson uh, role. Uh, Dr. Suyo, could you introduce Dr. Nishikan Thorat so that then uh, we will introduce the uh, speaker, sir? Yes, yes. So uh, thank you very much, Pallavi, for uh, uh, agreeing to moderate this session. Uh, let me tell my audience that this particular webinar is a part of a webinar series that uh, Indian Psychiatric Society West, Bo uh, West Zone Branch uh, is conducting. So we are on one Monday of uh, each month, try and bring speakers from uh, all across India, as well as from our uh, zone that are experts in their respective fields. They talk about various aspects of research. We started all the way from how to publish a case report, thereon uh, finding the study designs, calculating sample size, and uh, as well as uh, uh, reading an original research article as well. Now we have graduated and we believe that uh, we are ripe enough to understand uh, how to read a meta-analysis, how to uh, interpret a forest plot, etc. So we have a great speaker here. However, introducing the speaker is not my job. So, uh, Pallavi, can you put up uh, Dr. Nishikan sir's slide? Yes, so I think uh, our IT tech person will help us with going ahead with the slides. Uh, Yogendra ji? Yogendra ji, will you please uh, put the introduction slide for us? So without waiting for slide, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Nishikan Thora. Dr. Nishikan Thorath hails from Pune and uh, is associated with the prestigious BJ Medical College and Maharashtra Institute of Mental Health. Sir is Associate Professor of uh, Psychiatry at the Institute and each one of us know the legacy of uh, BJ Medical College Pune and the Department of Psychiatry there. There are stalwarts that have uh, this institute have generated and we are uh, privilege to have Dr. Nishikan Thorath as a chairperson for today's session. Dr. Thorath uh, is also the nodal person for addiction treatment facility. I believe that is the first uh, addiction treatment facility in the state of Maharashtra. Yes. And Dr. Uh, Thorath has been very instrumental in uh, guiding us at AIMS Nagpur in uh, initiating the similar project. So welcome Dr. Nishikan Thorath. Uh, the floor is yours. And, uh, yes. Yogendra ji, if you can uh, put Dr. Vikas Menon, uh, sir, slide, the introduction slide, so that our uh, chairperson can introduce, sir. Yogendra ji, you there? He is around. He is probably held up somewhere. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank so you, Sir. Do hmm. yeah. I think we'll go ahead. Okay. So. Thank you, Dr. Suyok uh, and Dr. Pallavi for uh, introducing me. And uh, uh, the idea about this particular presentation on every Monday regarding the uh, research in the field of psychiatry is very interesting and sounding uh, very inf informative and uh, helpful for the upcoming PG students as well as the faculties. Uh, I, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the office bearers of the IPS Red Zone Branch and uh, the research committee IPS Red Zone Branch uh, members for giving me opportunity to chair this session. Uh, Dr. Vikas Menon is a very well-known researcher in the field of psychiatry and is an alumni of Jeep uh, uh, Medical College at uh, Puducherry. And he's been very uh, thoroughly uh, following the research uh, uh, in psychiatry. He has done published various papers to his name, and is uh, a very is uh, a um, 
has a special interest in the area of mood disorders, suicide, digital psychiatry, therapeutics, medical education, and systematic reviews. He has been editor to a number of journals and is, I think, uh, also uh, was worked as a deputy edi editor in the Inter Journal of Psychiatry and editor of International Journal of Advanced Medical and Health Research. Hello. So, he doesn't Hello? require much. Much of an introduction. For the students and for all of us. With this introduction, I'll go to Dr. Mukas Menon to start this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nishikant. Uh, am I on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for confirming. So, uh, okay, okay, first like of all, you know, I am very thankful to oh. IPS Westone branch for uh, having me share here today. Content modun kai karo, screen karo, karo, karo. I think there is some disturbance. Pallavi, can Pallavi you I think, yeah, you need to mute yourself, please, Pallavi. Hi, Vikas. Hi, hi, madam. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you once again to IPS Westone branch for having me here. It is a, I'm deeply privileged and it's, it was very interesting to know the evolution of this, uh, of this webinar series also. I'm not, I was not aware of how the topics progress. So you have, unfortunately, unfortunately you have come to meta-analysis stage. So let us try and uh, wrap our heads around, uh, you know, how to read a meta-analysis paper. Not all of us may actually do a meta-analysis, but uh, at least I think as uh, <clears throat> as residents, as faculty, we should be able to at least read a meta-analysis paper and understand what are the basic uh, concepts that are being presented and how to judge the quality of evidence of a meta-analysis because uh, traditionally in the evidence hierarchy, meta-analysis comes right at the top. Although I have certain, uh, you know, certain divergent views about this, but that doesn't matter because... Uh, World over in the evidence pyramid, meta-analysis is considered right at the top of the evidence pyramid. So, which means that uh, when you are quoting evidence, when you are uh, uh, presenting evidence as, a, as part of a talk or as part of an answer that you would give in your postgraduate examination, if you're quoting from a meta-analysis, it carries greater weight or it is assumed to carry a greater weight. So, for that purpose, we should uh, learn to separate the wheat from the chaff and uh, know and cite good meta-analysis. So that's the entire point of this webinar. And uh, now I, with the moderator's uh, permission, I will share my slides. And it would be nice if somebody can just confirm that the slides are visible in full screen mode. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Suyog, yes, for, yes. for the thumbs up. So, <clears throat> so I put it uh, deliberately like this, you know, reading between the lines. Because it's visible. Forest plot is comprising of so many lines. So we also have to read the lines as well as read between the lines to know how uh, meta-analysis is to be interpreted. So this will be the outline of my presentation over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. We'll uh, just have a brief introduction to what is a meta-analysis and why a meta-analysis is needed. And uh, what, unfortunately, you know, we cannot read a meta-analysis paper unless we understand some basic concepts like what I have listed here. So I'll just try to, uh, you know, explain it very simply. Uh, as far as I understand, I'll try to make it very simple. And then, of course, the major thing that is how to read the forest plot and the prisma diagram, which are two uh, important components of, uh, and practically, you know, every meta-analysis will have these two figures. So you have to know how to read it and uh, understand it. And then at the end, some tools to assist reading and reviewing meta-analysis papers, which you can read at your own leisure and uh, try and uh, improve. So the objective of this session is to sensitize uh, all of you uh, to uh, what a meta-analysis paper is and what are the basic concepts and how to read a forest plot. And then of course, uh, you know, you have to do, you have to read uh, more papers repeatedly to uh, put this into practice. And then each paper has some different things to tell you and it's a different learning in itself. So before I start, I have no conflicts of interest with regard to this uh, presentation. Uh, so what is a meta-analysis? It's basically, you know, it originated somewhere in the 1940s when it actually originated in the fields of psychology uh, and social work rather than psychiatry per se, when 
uh, researchers were trying to make sense of the barrage of data that was available uh, in diverse psychological fields. So they thought there must be some statistical method that can be used to pool in the results of various studies in order to give some summary estimate that makes sense, that is accurately reflective of the uh, studies that are there in the literature. So that's what meta-analysis is, a statistical method to combine results of different studies. So you have various studies that are all providing what is called individual study estimates or point estimates, but you want to combine that and produce a pooled or a summary estimate, which by virtue of the larger sample size in a meta-analysis, you know, meta-analysis basically combines results from various studies. So once you combine studies, you have a larger sample size. And once you have a larger sample size, then the results that you have is more likely to be representative of the true value in the population, which is what we're interested in in research, isn't it? Your, sam your sample is there, but we want to know what is happening in the population. We cannot study the population, therefore we study a sample. But when meta-analysis pools the studies together, you assume that the result is a better reflection of the true value in the population. And meta-analysis can be conducted for a wide range of statistics. You can have meta-analysis of means, meta-analysis of mean difference, standardized mean difference. I'll explain these terms in the uh, next uh, couple of slides. So you can hold on to that. Meta-analysis of proportions such as prevalence, uh, odds ratios, risk ratios, hazard ratios. You can have meta-analysis for number needed to treat, number needed to harm. So for a wide range of statistics, you can have meta-analysis. So meta-analysis is usually nested within a systematic review. And why is that so? Because uh, so for many of us, you know, who may not be familiar with this term systematic review, it's very simple. It's a type of review that uses repeatable methods to find, select, and synthesize the available evidence. So uh, you, want to, uh, you want to do a review of literature using methods that are reproducible by people, you know. So that is what a systematic review is all about. It has a very focused research question and very uh, structured, repeatable search methods. Basically, a systematic review precedes a meta-analysis because it is through a systematic review that you identify the articles that are going to be included in your meta-analysis. If you don't do a systematic review prior to a meta-analysis, and you just select articles based on a non-systematic search of the literature, you are likely to uh, you're likely to be biased in your article selection. You may miss certain studies. For example, you may not know that certain sources of data exist. You may not, therefore, you may not search that. And therefore, you'll end up with a very biased uh, sample of studies. And when you, when you have a biased sample of studies, the result that you get will also be biased. So to avoid bias in article selection and avoid missing studies, you need, necessarily, you need a systematic review to proceed a meta-analysis. But here, we're not going to talk much about systematic review because that is a separate session itself. We'll restrict ourselves to what are the nuances in a meta-analysis paper that needs to be understood. So the bottom line here is that uh, meta-analysis is probably you can consider it as a very specialized subset of systematic reviews. Uh, and though meta-analysis is necessarily nested within a systematic review, the, uh, vice versa is not always true. A systematic review, you can have standalone systematic reviews that do not have a meta-analysis component, or you may have a systematic review with meta-analysis. Why do you need a meta-analysis? This is very important for us to understand. Why can't we just do without a meta-analysis? You know, so there are basically three situations in literature where a meta-analysis might help you. And I'll quote some examples from literature to uh, get this point across that how important a meta-analysis is. So, for example, you want to investigate uh, the question whether uh, R modafinil is effective for negative symptoms in schizophrenia compared to placebo. So you take the literature, you have several randomized control trials, you have some negative studies, you have some positive studies. Say, for example, you have four negative studies and six positive studies. How do you put, how do you make sense of this? Do you go by a simple vote counting approach? I have six positive studies versus four. So majority wins. And I consider that our mode of panel is effective for negative symptoms in schizophrenia. That's one way of doing it. But then you go deeper into these studies and then realize that the four negative studies actually put together have three times the sample size of the six positive studies, which were really small. So now you have a doubt. Oh, these are big studies which told, which produce negative findings. So maybe they, their findings are more credible. 
you know so that's what the confusion is all about and you actually need a meta analysis now to resolve this confusion so you cannot simply go by a mathematical averaging or a vote counting approach you need a more sophisticated uh, analysis procedure to uh, produce a summary estimate that is truly reflective of uh, the truth or what r mod of n really does to negative symptoms so incidentally so if you want to take a, an example from another field but which something which all of us can relate to we all know that streptokinase is effective in reducing mortality in myocardial infarction especially when given during the first 6 hours so randomized control trials began from 1959 onwards for examining the efficacy of streptokinase in myocardial infarction and went on till 1998 when the first meta analysis was done and at that time they found that uh, by 1973 onwards you know there was a clear statistical superiority for streptokinase over placebo but nobody bothered to do a meta analysis in 73 because it was the technique was not very popular at that time uh so in if the meta analysis had been applied to the data by 73 we could have saved 25 years of research funding being thrust into a question where the results were already very clear and we could have started using it and saving lives much earlier so therein lies the importance of doing meta analysis at the right time you can also do meta analysis when there are several small studies that throw up positive results but they are all statistically non significant because of their small sample size so that is where meta analysis helps you know meta analysis helps to pool the studies together and then when you pool the studies together you now you have a larger sample size and i think all of us understand that when study sample size is large it makes it easier to identify you have greater power to identify statistical significance you can finally you know suppose there are several studies all of them are positive all of them are statistically significant even their meta analysis may have a potential role because when you combine the studies you get a more precise estimate now because of by virtue of the larger sample size so you get a much you get a much more uh, you get a much more accurate uh, magnitude of the summary estimate and a more precise uh, value of the summary estimate so in all these uh, situations you can consider doing a meta analysis now i'm going to explain five basic concepts in a meta analysis uh, one by one so the first concept i'm going to explain is something called effect size which you will which you will invariably read when you uh, read a meta analysis paper so we need to understand what is effect size very simply put and uh, you know effect size is the difference between groups divided by units of standard deviation that's all there is to effect size now uh how to explain this you know why do we need an effect size so say for example you are wanting to conduct a meta analysis of antipsychotic or clozapine induced weight gain in schizophrenia so you have studies that express their outcomes in terms of changes in bmi and you have studies that express their outcomes in terms of mean change in body weight now because bmi and body weight are in different units you cannot simply combine them like that you need to convert them into some standard units another example suppose you want to examine the efficacy of uh, r modafinil on negative symptoms in schizophrenia let's go back to our r modafinil example so you get a sample of studies after you search literature some studies use panaces the positive and negative syndrome scale some studies use the sans some studies use the brief uh, the nsa negative symptom assessment uh, some other study uses something else so now you have a problem because different studies have used different outcome measures and the units are now different the ranges is ranges different so all these things so you need to bring in some kind of standardization so that you can uh, do a meta analysis and this is where effect size comes in because now you have divided the difference between groups by units of standard deviation the outcomes are now naturally not in terms of the original units but they are now in terms of units of standard deviation and because they are in units of standard deviation they are in the same units now they can be validly averaged across studies so you can actually tell that uh, you know the in the first study which examined clozapine uh, induced weight gain in schizophrenia uh, the difference between groups divided by units of standard deviation was 1.7 sd the other study would give maybe 2 sd and now you can uh, compare easily so that's how effect size basically works but now you have a problem there because you know you have an intervention and a control group and each group will have its own standard deviation you have one standard deviation for the intervention group values the mean change 
and you have one standard deviation for the control group values. So which standard deviation do you use if you want to uh, you know, produce or compute an effect size? So basically, depending on which standard deviation you use, you have three types of uh, effect size. Typically, when we say effect size, I'm just using the term standardized mean difference here because that is the example to understand uh, the examples of R mode FNL and close up in induced weight gain. But you can have effect size, uh, relative risk odds ratio, all that are effect size only. But for uh, purpose of understanding, I'm using the standardized mean difference example here. So depending on which SDU you, you use, you can have three types of uh, standardized mean difference effect sizes. One is the typical, uh, the common one is called Cohen's D. You might read about this in papers. When you read meta-analysis papers, they will write Cohen's D. Uh, the SMD was expressed in terms of Cohen's D and it was this much. So Cohen's D basically uses pooled standard deviation. So you have formula for pooling the standard deviation. Once you have SD1 and SD2, you have formulas or online calculators that will actually help you to generate the pooled SD. And if you use the pooled SD to calculate the effect size, what you're getting is called Cohen's D. So, sometimes you use uh, the SD of the control group. Uh, you know, because uh, for example, you may have multiple intervention groups in a study. You may have a three arm RCT. So you have two intervention groups now. So you, you don't know which one to use of the intervention groups to pool the SD. So you just make it simple and you, you use the SD of the control group. So that way, in some situations, you might want to use the SD of the control group and that then it's called glass delta, glasses delta. And then the last one is uh, hedges G, which is very popular, which is what the software Revman, you know, if you use Revman for meta-analysis, the output is in terms of hedges G. Basically, that also uses pooled SD, but it uses a correction factor because Cohen's D has some limitations when the sample size is, uh, when the total number of studies that are included in your meta-analysis is small. Cohen's D tends to overestimate the effect size. So in such cases, you can it's advised to use hedges G and a certain softwares automatically give you hedges G. So that's basically pooled SD with some correction factor. So that's, those are the three types of standardized mean difference. And uh, that is what uh, basically effect size is all about. So I just told you one example of uh, effect size, which is SMD, but all these, whatever I've listed here, the mean difference, standardized mean difference, RR, OR, HR, NNT, NNH, these are all examples of uh, effect sizes. So I have put a small table here to uh, explain to you which uh, effect size is to be used according to what is your outcome. So the effect size that you're reporting is actually dependent on what is your outcome. So uh, we'll try to see that. And then what is the scale on which you depict this uh, effect size? Because there are two, basically two scales and authors often tend to go wrong here in choosing the wrong scale to depict the uh, effect size in a meta-analysis. So that's something that's important for us to understand. Uh, the simplest meta-analysis probably you can do is meta-analysis of prevalence. Uh, so prevalence, as you know, is a proportion, you know, basically you have a numerator and a denominator. Denominator is all the people uh, at risk or all the people of the locality you're studying. And outcome is proportion of people with the condition of interest, be it uh, uh, treatment resistant schizophrenia, be it uh, relapse of schizophrenia, whatever. So outcome is proportion of people with the condition of interest. And because prevalence uh, is uh, of a condition, you know, is basically a proportion, it just has to be expressed on an arithmetic scale. I'll have, I'll show you examples of arithmetic scale and exponential scale in the next couple of slides. An arithmetic scale, very simply put, will have a zero. Uh, will have a, the null value will be zero. So because prevalence of a condition can also be zero, you necessarily need zero on a scale where you're expressing prevalence. And therefore the scale is arithmetic. So when you're doing, uh, for example, your effect size is mean difference, or sometimes it's also called WMD or weighted mean difference. Basically both mean the same thing. Uh, there's a concept called weighting of studies in a meta-analysis. So that's basically based on the, when we discuss the example of, you know, six positive and four negative studies, we discussed, isn't it? That the four negative studies have a larger sample size. So they receive a greater weight in the meta-analysis, basically. The, uh, the procedure weights the studies according to their sample sizes. So that's why it's called weighted mean difference, but you can just tell it as mean difference. That also means the same thing. Basically, mean difference is used when the outcome is continuous. For example, your weight gain uh, is your outcome or depression scores or uh, change in depression scores or uh, change in anxiety scores or whatever it is. So all those are continuous. And when all studies use the same tool or scale for measurement, then you use mean difference. More often than not, this is not the case, therefore, 
rarely only you see meta analysis using the effect size mean difference because invariably the studies you are including you know there will be uh, heterogeneity in terms of the tool uh, that they are using to measure the outcomes again in mean difference because the null value is zero you use an arithmetic scale standardized mean difference so when studies are using different tools for measurement so we gave the example of uh, negative symptoms measured using panaces uh, sans nsa and so on so there you have to use or depression uh, uh, studies using hamd madras bdi you have to standardize the scores now and therefore you use standardized mean difference again smd uh, the null value is zero therefore you have to use arithmetic scale now coming to the ratios risk ratios or relative risk there naturally you use it when the outcome is dichotomous that is either there is a risk of relapse in the intervention group divided by risk of relapse in the control group that's what is basically the relative risk or the risk ratio now as you know the null value of a ratio is 1 it's not zero so an exp so you have to use an exponential scale now and you cannot have a, you know a, a ratio of 0 the so the exponential scale will not have a value of 0 so you have to express ratios on exponential scale this is basic uh, understanding so odds ratios also used when outcome is uh, dichotomous so if some so where to use uh, rr and where to use or generally rr is used when you are examining longitudinal study designs for example cohort studies or randomized control trials which have a longitudinal assessment component always better to express outcomes in terms of rr on the other hand if you are doing cross sectional studies or meta analysis of cross sectional studies or case control studies you might want to preferably use or having said that i have come across plenty of uh, cohort studies reporting rr and uh, vice versa so but generally by and large this is how uh, we understand longitudinal designs better to use relative risk cross sectional or case control studies better to use odds ratio and once you have a ratio it's always exponential scale hazard ratios are a slightly different concept very similar in interpretation actually to rr and or but the concept is slightly different because there you are it's not just the whether the event has happened or not but when the event has happened so in other words the time to event so you're not because you know invariably everybody with schizophrenia will relapse at some point or the other so you are interested to know whether your medication actually uh you know lengthens the time to relapse significantly or uh, lengthens the time to mortality significantly or lengthens the time to any other outcome readmissions rehospitalizations and so on so necessarily study designs have to be longitudinal if you are assessing uh, if your outcome measure is hazard ratio because you are assessing time to an event so you necessarily need to follow them up and because it's a ratio automatically you have to exp uh, express it on an exponential scale so i'll just show you some examples of arithmetic and exponential scale to make it clear so as you can see uh this was a meta analysis that we did on trying to uh provide pooled prevalence estimates of depression among liver transplant patients so as you can see because it's prevalence it has to be expressed on arithmetic scale how do you know whether the scale is arithmetic or not the easiest way to do it is go to the x axis and see whether there is a zero on the scale so if there is a zero on the scale it has to be arithmetic scale and prevalence is expressed on arithmetic scale therefore the authors have used the correct scale so this is another uh, forest plot just leave out everything i'm going to explain uh, the forest plot in detail later but so just focus on the red boxes there this is another example of an arithmetic scale where the effect size as you can follow my cursor here so the effect size is smd that is standardized mean difference and uh, the effect size is expressed on an arithmetic scale because you have the zero line here the null line which is on zero now coming to exponential scale you can also call exponential scale as a logarithmic scale so log scale exponential scale they all mean the same thing so a ratio it's a ratio now the outcome measure because it's a response rate and therefore a response in the intervention group divided by response in the control group so you have risk ratio and as you can see the x axis doesn't have a zero like the null value is 1 so you automatically know now that it's an exponential uh, scale so that's all there is to effect sizes and the scales that are depicting it so we come to concept 2 now which is basically how to model the data you have basically you will come across some terms like fixed effects and random effects model in the meta analysis papers that you read uh, so very simply put both are testing different things basically the assumptions of these two models are different and they are testing different things so in fixed effects model it assumes that all studies are drawn from the same population therefore the question that fixed effects model tries to answer is because all studies are assessing the same population 
what is the best estimate of the population effect size? That's what the fixed effects model seeks to assess. That's the question that the fixed effects model seeks to assess. When you say random effects model, you know, basically random effects model does not assume that all studies are drawn from the same population. Uh, and usually random effects model is what is used in mo most meta-analysis because suppose I am doing a meta-analysis of ketamine versus ECT in, uh, in, in treatment resistant depression, for example, you know, so I include studies from all over the globe. So the way depression is diagnosed across cultures, uh, the way ketamine is administered across cultures, the pre-ketamine treatment advice that is given, the pre-ECT treatment counseling that is given, the ketamine protocols, the ECT protocol, they all may vary across cultures and settings, you know. So it's very hard to assume that we are drawing all studies from the same population. So that is how most of our psychiatry research questions work. So invariably, most of the time, you end up using a random effects model, but you have to understand that you should also use fixed effects model. And in uh, both cases, actually, they will give similar results if heterogeneity is not extreme. I'll explain the concept of heterogeneity later. So when there are between study heterogeneity is not too marked, both these models will give more or less the same results. But if heterogeneity is significantly high, you have to report both. Uh, you have to report both and then compare the effects. So typically, we have to write all this and decide which model you're going to use in advance and not after you see the data. So before doing a meta-analysis, you have to write a good protocol, just like how we write protocols for original studies. And just like we register protocols on CTRI and all, similarly, we have to register meta-analysis protocols on Prospero or other sites that are there, uh, other uh, registration sites, and then declare our uh, data analysis plan in beforehand. Uh, so that, you know, we are not accused of cheating with different models and just reporting the models that gave us a p-value less than 0 0.05, just like how, how, how we are not supposed to deviate from a registered protocol once we do it for the original studies. So basically, random effects model assumes that there is a continuum of effects and the studies are all being drawn from different populations. Therefore, the treatment effects will lie on a continuum. And therefore, what is, what is the average treatment effect across studies? That is the question that random effects model seeks to answer. So coming to the third concept, that is heterogeneity. Uh, this is basically testing to what extent the results of individual studies that are pooled in a meta-analysis are truly different and not just different due to chance factors. So that is what heterogeneity is all about. So you may have methodological heterogeneity for, across studies. For example, uh, coming back to the question of ketamine versus ECT in, in uh, depression, uh, there are several studies, but the studies may include different age groups. The gender distribution in studies may be different. The dose of ketamine that is administered across studies may be different. The number of ECT sessions that is given across studies may be different. Uh, the outcome measure that is used in different studies may be different. So you may have so many sources of methodological heterogeneity. But when we talk about heterogeneity, as a statistical concept in meta-analysis, we are measuring the statistical heterogeneity. So how much the results of the studies are actually different due to true differences and not due to chance. So there are various statistical tests for heterogeneity, uh, tau square, Cochrane skew, and the I square statistic. These all have different utilities. For example, you know, the Cochrane skew statistic is much dependent on the number of studies that you include. So one metric by itself will not tell you the complete picture about heterogeneity. That's why in the output plot in uh, most softwares, more than one heterogeneity statistic is reported so that you know you can actually get a uh, glance uh, at all the heterogeneity statistics together and then make your interpretation. But I have put one I square statistic alone in red here because invariably that is what we most commonly end up interpreting or highlighting because I, I don't know the reason exactly for this, but I think the reason is because, you know, it's the only statistic for which uh, there is a rule of thumb uh, interpretation. So they say that less than 50% is low heterogeneity, 50 to 75% is moderate and more than 75% is high. That's a very conventional threshold. So you have uh, very clear cut guidelines for interpreting I square statistic and we all like clarity, isn't it? When we uh, rather than confusion when we interpret statistics. 
so probably that is the reason why that's the only reason i can think of why i square is the most popular so that is what basically heterogeneity uh, indicates and it's very easy to find out heterogeneity for example this is a forest plot where uh, the i square you know you can see the heterogeneity they are presenting the tau square the chi square uh, chi square is basically the cochrane skew only the cochrane skew follows a chi square distribution so you will actually see it mentioned as a chi square although i'm not sure if certain softwares might give you the queue but revman usually will give you as chi square only this is output for a plot from revman and then uh, you have the i square here which is actually zero so that means there is no heterogeneity in the studies if a very easy way to check heterogeneity by eyeballing the data is you go to the confidence intervals so uh, i know i have not explained the forest plot in detail but you know the squares and whiskers that you can see on your screen basically the whiskers is actually indicating the confidence intervals so i'll explain this but uh, just now keep in mind that if the confidence intervals of the studies are all overlapping then that's a good eyeball is eyeball estimate that the heterogeneity is not very significant and here you can actually see that the confidence intervals of all the studies are overlapping therefore the i square is zero to contrast with that i'll show you another forest plot where the i square if you can see is actually 99% 99. Point, so it's nearly 100% heterogeneity and then if you go to the uh, squares and whiskers and check the confidence intervals you know you can easily make out that they are all over the place here you know you have uh, one study here at all which is at this end of the uh, spectrum uh, and de martini is at the right and you know there is a lot of uh, difference between the the confidence intervals are just so far apart that you know you, there is absolutely no overlap so just by eyeballing the data itself you can get an idea about the heterogeneity and then confirm by looking at the i square statistics right the fourth concept i'm going to explain is uh, basically risk of bias assessment it's very it's very important to assess the quality of the studies that are included into your meta analysis because entirely the results of meta analysis depends on what kind of studies you feed in so that's called the garbage in garbage out uh, source of or the validity threat to a meta analysis you feed in studies of poor quality what you get the output also will be of poor quality just to give you an example of how you know how risk of bias can actually influence <coughs> study estimates this is uh, the, this is from one of our papers where the top panel actually gives you the main analysis that we did which comprised five studies and you can see the pooled estimate there was actually expressed in terms of standardized mean difference and uh, <coughs> it crossed the line of no effect you can see the upper bound of the ci was crossing zero the side and it was 0 0.02 the results were not statistically significant the p value was 0 0.06 but when we did a risk of bias assessment we found that three out of these five trials had <coughs> high risk of bias so we did a sensitivity analysis which is very conventional that you remove the studies with low risk of bias and do a sensitivity analysis and lo and behold you know now we got a significant difference the confidence intervals all came to one side of the null value, which means that the result is now statistically significant. So actually removing those methodology, methodologically weaker studies enhanced the <coughs> results of the meta-analysis and actually gave us a significant result. So that is the extent to which uh, you know low-quality studies can actually pull your results on either side. It could happen the other way also. Low-quality studies can pull your study, pull your study estimates towards significance when it's not actually significant. But it uh, this is just to underscore the importance of assessing the risk of bias of individual studies and then uh, dealing with that as best as you can. So there are standard tools to available uh, which are available to assess the risk of bias. You have the Cochrane Risk of Bias version 2.0, which was released in 2019, which you uh, all across the world, you use that for randomized control trials. Then you have the Newcastle Ottawa scale, which is used for observational study designs. These are the two most popular tools that are available, but you have the JBI family of tools also where they have tools for every study design. And this is a good resource for you from University of North Carolina, where you can actually go to their site and see the options that you have in terms of quality assessment instruments, but you really don't need to do that. More or less, uh, these three tools will suffice for 95% of your meta-analysis efforts. The last concept I'm going to discuss is called publication bias. Uh, so this is also something that we need to have some introduction to uh, when we are reading meta-analysis papers. Uh, so before that, just a small introduction about what is publication bias. So invariably, you know, we cannot guarantee or we cannot be assured that all studies which have 
evaluated a particular research question has found their way into the literature in terms of getting published and have been located in your search. We can never be 100% sure. So uh, on the other hand, we can be reasonably sure that small studies which have negative findings are never going to get published because either the authors are not interested in getting it published because the study was a negative finding, editors are not interested in getting it published because the study is negative, and definitely industry funders are not going to get it, uh, you know, are not going to pursue the paper for publication because they don't want to show their molecule in poor light. So because of all these reasons, you often end up with ne several negative studies that are not getting published, or this is called a file drawer effect, because you just put it into the file, uh, you know, you just file the study in your drawer and just leave it there and don't pursue it further. But how to, how to find out whether there is actually publication bias has, has influenced your uh, results or not. So that is through the funnel plot. So the funnel plot is basically a scatter plot of the effect size or some measure of the effect size on the x-axis. Here it's the log odds ratio versus a measure of variance or precision that is standard error here on the y-axis. And then it's called a funnel because you have small studies which are distributed on the bottom end of the funnel because they have uh, a wider dispersion in their effect sizes because they are small, you know. So small studies have greater dispersion of effect sizes. And as you go up, all the larger studies which produce more precise results come together on the top. So it's like a funnel shape. So that's why it's called a funnel plot. So that's all there is to it. So if you draw the, the dotted vertical line is actually the uh, summary effect size. And from there, if you draw two diagonal lines, you know, diagonal, uh, the dotted lines, they indicate the 95% confidence intervals and you should have a good distribution of studies across both sides of the line of no, a line of uh, overall effect. So this is a very symmetric funnel plot, what is shown here, because you have studies, each study, by the way, you know, those dots that are there, each dot is one study. So now you can understand, you know, there's a very nice distribution of the dots on both sides of these studies, both at the upper portion of the funnel and lower portion of the funnel. Now contrast that with uh, uh, the figure on the panel below. So you can see that, you know, there is this corner of the funnel plot where there are no studies there. So can actually make, by eyeballing the funnel plot, you can make out that there's some evidence of publication bias. There is no study, especially small studies, you know, which are producing small effect sizes have not been published. So this is one way of, uh, one way of, what do you say? One way of uh, trying to get uh, get an idea about whether there's publication bias. So this is a very simplistic explanation, but this is this should suffice for us to understand and read majority of the papers, right? Now I'll come to the. Uh, a very important couple of slides on how to read a forest plot. And I'll spend some time here because I'll go row by row and column by column. So the title actually indicates the forest plot, what it's, what is the outcome measure, what are the groups and what is the, out, uh, what kind of analysis it is, whether it's a main analysis or sensitivity analysis. And then the first row is basically the study and the year. So uh, as you can see below that, you know, each study, the first author followed by et al. And then you have the year of publication. Then the second, uh, uh, the second element there in the top row is the intervention group. Uh, intervention followed by control it is. Here it's two active treatments that are being compared, but normally it is intervention followed by control. So intervention here is the ECT. And then you have the post-treatment mean and SD that are being shown. Total sample in the ECT group in every study. And then the control group here is ketamine. And what is the post-treatment mean depression score in the ketamine group? and bracket standard deviation. What is the total number of subjects in the ketamine group in the study that uh, you are including in the meta-analysis? And then what is the effect size? That is standardized mean difference here. IV stands for inverse variance. Inverse variance is a method of weighting the studies. Basically, as I said earlier, as the sample size increases, the variance decreases and the weight of the study increases. So as because variance and weight share a reciprocal relationship, it's called inverse variance. So very simple, that is uh, the inverse variance technique to weight a study in a meta-analysis. And then whether they have used the fixed or random effects model, which we discussed a while ago. So they have used the random effects model. And then you have the point estimate in bracket, you have the 95% confidence intervals. So that is how you understand each study that is going on, that is included. Each study that is entered into the meta-analysis is entered into these uh, elements and it makes it easy to understand. Now on the right side, you have the actual forest plot, which is basically a plot that has only the x-axis. So you can quickly see that the x-axis is on an arithmetic scale. 
and uh, the y there is no y axis actually for a forest plot it has only x axis but then you have the 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 squares and the whisker or box and whisker however you want to call it so each box represents the point estimate of the individual studies so 0.38 it it will correspond to 0.38 on the x axis and then the whiskers that are on either side it indicates the confidence interval so it indicates minus 0.68 to 0.09 minus 0.09 for the x trans study the whiskers range from minus 0.34 which is minus so it is on this side of the forest plot to uh, on you know 1.56 which is on the uh, positive side of the uh, line of uh, no effect that's why it's positive sign so that way you try and understand and then you have squares and whiskers for each of the studies at the end you have a rhombus or a diamond which represents the pooled estimate so the total uh, pooled that is the the last row here is indicating the pooled estimate and the pooled sample sizes so you have the pooled sample size in the ect group pooled sample size in the ketamine group and the pooled value of the smd this is called the pooled smd these were all uh, the individual study smds and for the pooled smd also you get a confidence interval so the central line in the rhombus indicates the pooled effect size while the width of the rhombus indicates the 95% confidence intervals and because the 95% confidence intervals are straddling the uh, null value therefore overall the p value is not the results are not significant on the right hand side you have the weight of the study how much each uh, in terms expressed in terms of percentage so uh, as i said studies which have larger sample will always contribute greater weight to a meta analysis you can check this understanding by checking the sample sizes of x trend which easily has the highest sample size among all the studies that are included so that is contributing the greatest weight uh, the ghasemi study had only a sample size of 9 plus 918 so it should contribute the least weight is that correct yes the ghasemi study contributes the least weight to the meta analysis together it totals 100 and they, it here also it indicates smd uh, inverse variance random effects and 95% confidence intervals this line already I explained earlier, heterogeneity, you have the tau square, chi square and the, uh, the degree of freedom is 4 because there are 5 studies in the meta-analysis, so n minus 1 is the degree of freedom. The heterogeneity overall is not significant, i square is 45%, that's low heterogeneity. The test for overall effect, as I said, because the rhombus, upper, uh, the one end of the rhombus straddles the line of no effect, you have p-value of just which is missing significance, 0.06. So this is very simply how you read a forest plot and uh, this is another example of a forest plot which is on a logarithmic scale or exponential scale basically but it's otherwise the same principles you have the log hazard ratio the standard error so this is something that the, you don't have to break your heads over because the once the software you enter the hazard ratio automatically it computes the log hazard ratios and SE. basically log transforms the hazard ratio so that the interpretation is easier otherwise the confidence intervals in a ratio will not be equidistant and it will lead to problems with interpretation. So that is how uh, otherwise otherwise the rest of it is pretty much the same in terms of how you interpret uh, the forest plot. The last part, how to read a Prisma diagram. I'll uh, wind up in another couple of minutes. How to read the Prisma diagram. This is, uh, I'm sure all of you must be familiar with it. It is easier to read actually than a forest plot. So the uh, this is the updated Prisma diagram which was uh, came out in 2021. In, in the BMJ. So you have a left hand side and a right hand side of the Prisma diagram. The left hand side is basically uh, the records identified from various databases that you have searched. And then the first box here says how many two, uh, records were removed before screening. So you have duplicate records removed by humans using automation tools. Automation tools are basically, you know, you have software that help you to do the search and the study selection uh, like Rayan or Covidence. So they will deduplicate the records for you. So uh, you can do that. Uh, you can make use of the software, but you mentioned the numbers that are uh, deduplicated there. Then records marked as ineligible using automation tools, records removed for other reasons, such as incompatible language and other things. So in this particular meta-analysis, we didn't have uh, any such study there. That's why the entries are zero. The rest of it is... Oh, 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 oh. Records screened and records excluded. Then how many full texts were sought for retrieval? How many were not retrieved? Then reports assessed for eligibility is how many full texts were assessed. And then for at each stage, you give the number of studies that are excluded with the reasons. On the right-hand side, you have you are also supposed to manually screen the citations 
because sometimes, as I said, you know, there's no guarantee that your search is comprehensive enough to identify all studies. So always look for supplemental sources by when you get a relevant study, go through their citations manually and identify. So how many records were identified through that sources? And then the rest of it is how many full text sought for retrieval and the rest of it is the same as the left hand side. Right. Uh, the last couple of slides, tools for reading and reviewing a meta-analysis paper. You have basically two tools that are quite useful to you. You can go through them. They will supplement your understanding of what all are to be included in the meta-analysis under various sections of the paper. The Prisma checklist and the flow diagram. The flow diagram we just now explained now, but there is a Prisma checklist also. And then there is an Amstar checklist. So Prisma checklist is basically... I think many of us will be familiar with this term, preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which is basically an update of uh, its, its predecessor that is called quality of reporting of meta-analysis or Quorum. In 2009, Prisma superseded Quorum and now you have the Prisma uh, updated Prisma that was published in 2021. It pro basically provides uh, seven subheadings and 27 items that are to be checked, minimum set of information that is to be so as researchers, before we design a meta-analysis protocol and when we do a meta-analysis protocol, it's better to be guided by the Prisma checklist. And uh, most journals now require the author to submit a Prisma checklist and a flow diagram also with a uh, filled in Prisma checklist with any systematic review that you submit. So I'm not going to go through all the headings, but this is basically the headings in a Prisma checklist and what are the items to be included. So it's a very structured thing. So you can actually go through that and see what is to be included in the title, abstract, introduction, methods, each section of the paper. Similarly, in Amster, it's a measurement tool to assess systematic reviews. So it was developed in 2007, but uh, revised in uh, subsequently in 2017. So that's the latest version that's uh, being used now. Uh, it was unlike a Prisma, which is a reporting checklist, and Amstar is a critical appraisal checklist. So that is actually what you want to perhaps use to critically appraise a published systematic review, particularly systematic reviews involving randomized control trials. Uh, the original version has 11 items and it used to give a numerical score, but the revised version has done away with the numerical total score and gives an overall global rating. It has 16 items. These are the 16 items in Amstar. So you can go through it at your leisure, the Amstar checklist. And basically, many of the concepts which we explained now have also been included there, like whether risk of bias was assessed adequately, uh, whether the heterogeneity, publication bias, all these concepts are also included in Amstar. Right. So the take-home message is that uh, I would say a well-conceptualized, well well, well uh, you know, well-conducted, well-analyzed, well-interpreted and well-written meta-analysis is probably at the top of the evidence uh, pyramid and is a valuable tool to draw more precise conclusions about treatment effects. And it can be conducted on various study designs, but the principles remain the same, whatever study designs you are pooling. And if these principles are well understood, even if we cannot do a meta-analysis ourselves, at least we can reasonably understand meta-analysis papers and judge the validity of their conclusions. So these are some training resources that are probably useful for you. The Bible, of course, is the Cochrane Handbook, which is currently in version 6.4 and, uh, you know, released last year. So you can, it's a free resource for those of us from India. So you can just go to Cochrane and uh, click on the link and stay, you know, stage by stage, all uh, stages of meta-analysis are explained there. So that should really be your guiding handbook if you want to do a meta-analysis. And uh, there are some free online courses uh, I have not done those courses myself. I learned meta-analysis by doing, but uh, you can actually get a good uh, introduction to uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis by uh, joining, signing up for some of these online courses. Uh, I have attended some of these offline workshops which were conducted by the Christian Medical College where I had my uh, introduction to meta-analysis and softwares. So I would like to acknowledge inputs given by Dr. Shahul. Uh, I think he has spoken previously in this webinar here, webinar series for giving some inputs to improve the intellectual content of this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your patient listening. I hope I have not been too taxing on your gray cells and uh, at least have been able to simplify some things and uh, get through the messages. I'm happy to take questions now. Over to the moderator. Yes, please. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Menon. I will not turn on the video because I have done enough catfish for the day. <laughs> but thank you very much. And uh, you literally simplified it as if it was a takeover. Although um, it, it's, it's a great learning and you have uh, summarized everything very well. We have two questions from the audience. Uh, 
uh, so far uh, firstly dr uh, arun ji had uh, questions that uh, what's the meaning of inverse variance and uh, meta regression right so uh, these were some uh, meta regression particularly was a concept i couldn't touch within the allotted time but i'll okay. since the question is there i'll try to touch yeah. upon it now inverse variance is uh, simpler to understand than meta regression inverse variance as i said uh, see when you have when you have multiple studies in a meta analysis you know all of them give you some point estimate either mean difference or uh, for example mean change in body weight or mean change in bmi isn't it different studies will give you different uh, mean changes all these mean changes that come from different studies are associated with different standard deviations they don't have the same standard deviation the standard deviation will differ because the variance between the study will differ based on the sample size if you have a larger sample size the variance of your study result expressed as standard deviation or standard error or whatever uh, measure you are using for the variance will decrease once the sample size increases and generally in a meta analysis weighting of the studies you know you have to assign a study a particular weight because as i said a study which is having a sample size of 1000 versus another study which is having a sample size of 100 you cannot give the same weight to both studies in a meta analysis the top, the sample size the study with sample size of 1000 has to carry a greater weight because it has a larger sample size and it's more closer to the population value so naturally the study with a sample size of 1000 has a larger sample therefore lesser variability in the results lesser standard deviation therefore receives a greater weight that is what inverse variance is as the variance in the study findings decrease the weight assigned to the study increases so it's a reciprocal relationship that is why it's called inverse variance now coming to the second uh, question that is meta regression so meta regression see once we uh, it basically stems from the heterogeneity that you identify so once we identify that there is significant heterogeneity the heterogeneity is 80% 90% whatever it is it is significant heterogeneity now you cannot stop there you have to go back and if you are doing a good meta analysis you cannot stop there you have to go back and find out the source of heterogeneity where is this heterogeneity coming from now there are various ways to explore heterogeneity you can do a subgroup analysis you might have read this term called subgroup analysis in some studies you can do a meta regression a meta regression is basically nothing but a, a linear regression in which the out so in linear regression i think all of you are familiar with the concept of linear regression so let's use that to understand meta regression in a linear regression you have a dependent variable and you have an independent variable isn't it if it's a simple linear regression you have one independent variable if it's a multiple linear regression you have multiple independent variables that's why it's called a multiple regression so in a meta regression the outcome or the dependent variable is your effect size and the independent variable is whatever you think might have contributed to the heterogeneity so typically first we do a just like how we do in other original papers you know first we do a simple meta regression uh, taking for example duration of the study i think that duration of the study may be one reason why there is high heterogeneity in my sample that is based on my understanding i might also think that sample size differences between studies is contributing to the heterogeneity so i just put everything in a simple linear regression and see what is explaining the heterogeneity and the significant variables i combine into a multiple linear regression or a multiple meta regression and then see how much percentage of the variance in the dependent variable is explained by the independent variable that's very that's very similar to what we do in a linear regression so uh, just the term might sound high fi but actually it is nothing but a linear regression where the dependent variable is the effect size and the independent variable is whatever you think would have contributed to the heterogeneity So uh, one more question from Dr. Arunjit was, uh, what are the open source softwares to learn how to draw uh, forest plot? Because uh, he raises the concern that uh, the Rayman software is paid. So where can they learn how to draw it with uh, any open source material? So it's it's really unfortunate that Rayman has recently become uh, you know behind a paywall. Uh, but it was not like that till last year uh, it was not like that revman was totally free software 
uh well there are still ways to get around it there are some links which i can share with uh, those of you who are interested uh, i can share the links for the revman which you can download and install in your uh, in your computer uh, and then you can work on that it's a pretty intuitive software and you don't have to actually draw the forest plot you don't have to do all that the software does it for you all what you have to do is feed in the studies into the software and enter the effect center this whatever you know we saw in the forest plot what is the mean of the experimental group what is the mean of the control group what is the standard all that information is there in the paper so you just have to extract the information from the paper that is called data extraction and you have to enter that into the relevant cells in the when the uh, forest plot diagram opens up and lo and behold you know the software will create the forest plot for you so it's, it's as simple as that so okay. there is no there is no there is no rocket science there uh, hello so vikash think, yeah. hello yes sir please go ahead yeah uh, may i just contribute yes, because please, uh, please, please, please. there is a software uh, called jasp okay that is jeffrey's uh, amazing statistical software it is absolutely free and it offers you to do uh, the uh, meta analysis of it yeah Thank It's you so completely much. Completely free, downloadable on Windows, on Apple, and even through a browser, one can do it. You can just put that on the chat box so that everybody. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. I'll do Abhishek, that. Will you okay. please add it to the chat box? Thank you. I'll so, do that. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate that yeah. input. Uh, there was one more question from Dr. Shalaka Chaturikar. She has asked that uh, which softwares are suggested for SRMA and uh, forest plots. one wishes to yeah so like see i have done most of my meta analysis it depends on the research question actually so for if we, if you're doing an intervention if you're doing a meta analysis of say randomized control trials i generally find that the forest plots that are generated by revman are cleaner uh, give greater information and are widely accepted by journals you have plenty of softwares uh, but but each software has certain uh, limitations for example revman is not so good for a prevalence meta analysis when you have two groups you know you're comparing two groups always i would use revman as the as my as my software of choice but if i'm doing a single group meta analysis say for example prevalence you know there you don't have several groups no you only have a population and you want to tell the prevalence i have used stata so stata is one software that uh, also gives you uh, forest plots so it all depends on uh, what is your research question and uh, you know how uh, how the data are aligned and how many groups you have and so on but most of my meta analysis i have done using revman and stata thank you dr menam so these were chiefly two questions and there are some comments on the chat box but i believe you have covered everything in your presentation so if anyone has missed anything if they go back to recording i think they will get access to the resources you have shared in your slides as well as that right So I will invite chairperson to contribute his uh, uh, two words and then his uh, <laughs> view about today's session. Doctor Thora, please. Yes. Uh, before that, any more uh, questions or uh, comments from the audience? Uh, anyone want to contribute? So I think uh, uh, this was a very lucid presentation by Doctor Vikas. Uh, Was a very complex topic. How to read a meta-analysis paper and how to read a uh, forest plot. And uh, uh, many times in research, we do come across such uh, difficulties when we want to uh, assess a meta-analysis paper and how to go about it. I think Dr. Vikas has very, uh, in a very simplified way, he has presented and uh, a very thorough knowledge about the. Uh, uh, this meta analysis and how to go about it and which i am sure that the audience has uh, again knowledge and insights into the presentation and i think it is a recorded session so uh, one can go back and again request the research committee to uh, have a look at it if they have any more questions or any doubts regarding the present uh, the topic I thank uh, Dr. Vikas Menon for a uh, very lucid presentation into this topic, and thank you organizers also who uh, have conducted uh, this presentation on the meta-analysis uh, for all. Thank you. Over to Dr. Pallavi. Uh, 
thank you, Chairperson of the Thurat. I once again thank uh, IPS Wisdom uh, official team, our President, our Secretary, our IT team, without whose help we cannot conduct this session seamlessly. And I thank our speaker, specifically Dr. Minan, because he has made it really, really simple and he has broken down in all these slides to understand people who had no access to this uh, learning and training. Because not institutes and not all places have access to academic research resources. So I uh, really appreciate this. And then we had robust uh, attendance today. We had 50 plus attendees on a Monday evening. And that's uh, really creditable to our speaker, sir, and his resources. Uh, so I would thank all our team members. I th thank the audience. And then I would conclude the session here. Uh, Dr. Suyo, uh, is that all that we should do today? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pallavi, for uh, taking this. So uh, I would like to thank Vikas, sir, for taking his time out and uh, helping us understand something that I always found very difficult to make sense of. And uh, Nishant, sir, for taking his time on a Monday evening and uh, helping us out here. Uh, I would also like to thank the President and Secretary of HIFIOS with Zoom who trusted us uh, with the responsibility. And uh, especially Hinal Madam for encouraging us with her uh, presence here. I think uh, we should conclude here. Yes, please. Thank yeah. you.